I went to Stanford Hill driving, <laughs> and I'm sure you've done the same. My friends say the same thing. No, going to the, ho uh, the hospital, and there's a Jewish section. Yes. The Royal Friends. Wait, hold on. The whole top upstairs. Wait. Now listen to this. The men, this is a street in London, yeah, in liberal London. The men are walking on one side of the road, and the women are saying, now I'm saying, well done. Okay, you've done what you need to do. No problem, yeah? I'm not, I haven't got, I haven't got a problem with that, okay? But we're not talking about the inside the synagogue. We're talking about in the streets. Everything that Islamophobic people are angry about Islam with is found in Judaism. Done, done, done. Everything from A to Z. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace, welcome to the Dean Show, which is a way of life. We try to put out there for everyone to see, helping you understand Islam and Muslims. Have you guys met Muhammad? Hijab, well, he's here with me on the Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> How you doing, my brother? Doing? You're right. I'm good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. We had a nice training, huh? Yeah, we did. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, especially with your, mashallah, advanced black belt skills. I mean, you definitely know how to take it out of someone. <laughs> mashallah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I, I know we worked up a, a, a nice sweat, and mm. uh, I can't leave my brother without some, you know, uh, <laughs> some some proteins and some, yeah, some uh, proteins, yeah? yeah, some nice. Uh, Oh juice over here oh, okay okay to replenish to replenish the body now Inshallah. What's, what's in this juice okay so i'm gonna have you taste it you're gonna have to trust me okay all right so i'm gonna get you some here and tell me you got some protein in <coughs> here you got some uh, natural sugars all right because mm, okay. we burned off a, a lot from the training Bismillah. you know we've been talking a lot about also mm. nutrition on the dean show i don't know uh people have been following along it's real important how's it how's it taste Tastes actually quite good. Bismillah. Mmm. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Good, mm. good one, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. I could have gave you... What's in it? What's in it? I could have gave you a... Yeah. Um, one of those uh, 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 protein protein, shakes. Pro protein yeah. shakes, but if but if you look at the back of most of these, you have a list of ingredients that you need a chemistry degree to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> so here, three. Three okay. ingredients. Okay. You got two banana, uh, one banana, okay. right for the sugar, mm -hmm. natural sugar, yeah. and then you had two raw eggs. You gotta raw, be or, or raw <laughs> eggs in this. Yeah. <laughs> you want protein? Yeah. We go straight to the source, huh? Wow, man, it doesn't taste like it's got eggs in. But this. but but it, but it has to be organic. It has mm. to be from you know healthy chickens, and then you got some uh, cashew milk. Bam, got it done. Three ingredients. Mm -hmm. Now compare that next time when you have you know uh, what was that? What was that um, that one that you had before? What was it called? Mother milk. What was it muscle called? Milk. Muscle milk. You heard of this muscle no, milk? No. Turn that around, and right. you've got like twenty different ingredients and in what yeah. in this, and you don't got only Allah knows what's you know in there. <laughs> this stuff uh, can really a lot of it can have a, a negative effect on the body. Yeah. So you like that? That was good, mashallah. All right, good. It doesn't taste like it had any eggs in it whatsoever. No. Yeah. Many people are scared of the yeah because yeah. like it's raw eggs yeah is it, was it raw it was obviously raw, raw eggs raw. So yeah, yeah so it's got to be that's it mm -hmm. all right so uh, we got some uh, we got had some jujitsu going yeah. we got some uh, nutrition here but you're not the only one I mean uh, you you well, I'm not the only fan of your jujitsu oh yeah yeah I'm not the only fan of your jujitsu because <laughs> I mean uh, we've got someone who is actually of note who is wearing your t-shirt I mean let's take a look at this oh. <laughs> Hey, that that's our buddy. We were actually that's right. uh, our friend Joe Rogan. That's your T-shirt, though, isn't it? Yeah, that is uh, our T-shirt. Yeah, that's, that's your surname on that. That's my that. surname. In in uh, yeah, that's my last name. So yeah. you, because you made a video right w with one of the with one of the mashayikh yeah. before about about um, Joe Rogan and some of his um, some of the things that he said about Islam. Yeah. What do you think this is a kind of peace offering or what is this? I don't know. I think. You know, like I like I mentioned in the video we did, yeah. we really wanted to reach out to Joe yeah, yeah. in a benign and nice, kind way. Mm -hmm. And because we're a small community, the community of jiu-jitsu practitioners, yeah. and he's done a lot of good in bringing jiu-jitsu to the forefront. Mm -hmm. right? He's you got to give acknowledgement where acknowledgement is due. Mm -hmm. And he talks about other good topics here, about nutrition and other things. Mm -hmm. uh, this but, is you got the recipe. Uh, no, no. I'm actually, <laughs> if, if Joe turns in, I'm, he, maybe I could turn, to, uh, turn him out to this recipe. Right. right? Um, I got this actually for my nutrition, the Jim Marlowe. All right, okay. Yeah. So now, Joe, he kind of went out of his lane. He started yeah. to talk about something that's uh, near and dear to over 1.7 billion human beings mm -hmm. on the planet, Muslims, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And Muslims, as you know, and I know, is someone who simply is taking that free choice that 
he has, that I have, a woman has, a man has, and just submitted their will to the will of the Creator. That's, right. That's it. Yeah. So he started talking about Islam. He started bringing on guests. Mm-hmm. And we academically, without much emotion, right? Not just, you know, yeah. uh, hurling in the insults or whatnot. We went, and me and the Imam yeah. from his area, mm-hmm. we went one by one. He talked about. Uh, FGM, female genital mutilation. We acid refute attacks or something. acid attacks. Yeah. You have a lot of those now against Muslims, right? In yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is interesting. I, I, I found it really interesting that yeah. he was um, making the point that acid was thrown by Muslims on Muslims or by Muslims on non-Muslims. Yeah. Where I'm from, obviously in London, um, in it's particularly in East London and parts of London, uh, that's actually happening now to Muslims. Acid has always been something which has been used. Uh, by different peoples to try and inflict harm on, on people. I, I never thought it would be seen as a Muslim-specific problem. But yeah, he's dealt with that, the Imam, yeah. did he? And we dealt with mm. that. We dealt with um, mm. many other... There was about seven misconceptions. misconceptions yeah. And we cleared those up. Anybody who wants to go and see what actually was talked about, they can go and they mm. can uh, they can uh, look That's that up. That's you done. Yeah, we did yeah. that. But now it's interesting. We were, we were talking a little bit. And you, you mentioned Joe, and I. Uh, that's very interesting. He's very wearing our shirt. He's wearing. Yes. That's actually my last name on his shirt yeah. in one of his shows, and that's not Photoshop. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. What do you think? I, I think <laughs> honestly, this is because uh, Joe, Joe Rogan. He's um, he's obviously going out. He, he's he's got a lot of followers. He's not going to actually put that T-shirt on unless he's done it strategically. I don't believe he's that kind of a haphazard slapdash kind of human being. Mm-hmm. So I think it was a, it was a message, and I think it was a was a positive message. And I think he does respect, Joe Rogan respects people who are Muslim and are kind of practitioners of a martial art. Mm-hmm. Like he respects Khabib, he respects, um, he, I think he respects you, he respects um, other people he's mentioned Muslims uh, in his in his shows, in his podcast. So I think this is a, is a kind of like a peace offering. I do think that. Yeah. Mm. Well, we really want him to, in our last video, we sent that message that, hey, yeah. If you, we'd love for you to talk about Islam. Yeah. You know, we'd love for us to be a part of the conversation, though. Right. right. So to have someone like I mentioned, the Imam that was here last time, invite mm-hmm. him. Hey, I can be your hookup. Mm-hmm. I can make it happen. Mm-hmm. Maybe, a lot of times, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Maybe you can't reach these people. You don't have the connections. Right. But now he's got the connection from he's the Dean Show. He's got yeah, yeah. me. Now you. Mm-hmm. So hopefully, what mm-hmm. we want to do with this program, how about we go through some, because it looks like. Mm. His work, you know, that he's done has affected a lot of people. Yeah. And, and many people have also brought to our attention some other things that he's said, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So maybe we can go through some of these videos. Yeah, sounds great. What do you think? No, it sounds great. And brilliant. at the end, with the intention that uh, maybe he can invite you. Inshallah. We can go down together. We can go down. Train man. some jiu-jitsu, yeah, hang yeah. out. Maybe he's got some recipes. <laughs> yeah. All in the essence of peace and we'll understanding, right? Yeah, yeah, excellent. All right, so why don't we start with our with the first video, and then right. we can go from there. Huh? Okay. We're going to have a lot of fun on this episode. God willing, Joe Rogan, he can go through this also. It'll be a lot of fun for him mm. as well and many of his viewers. Let's go to uh, the first one, and then we'll get your comments on that. Inshallah. The term radical Islam gets thrown around. Right, so radical Islam simply means I really take my Islam seriously, right? It's, it's, let's draw a, a silly analogy. Now, Mm-hmm. Should we keep it going or that's good? Yeah, I mean, that's fine. I mean, okay, so per, for, you've heard that. So pretty yeah. much uh, you can interpret that. And I think this one, just the title in itself, I yeah. don't know if he if he puts this or people who are, work with him, but you know, just the title where yeah. this one is at is called The Dangers of Islam. Right. So just by the title itself, right. it's like, you know, uh, yeah. putting Islam under the bus. Mm-hmm. And now this person who he brings on frequently, yeah. he pretty much says it, pretty much uh, if you practice Islam, that's what it translates yeah. to. You know, you're pretty much a radical. So any, he's pretty much labeling all 1.7 million Muslims or uh, any of those that mm-hmm. are praying, giving in charity, mm-hmm. trying to be a good human being, mm-hmm. a good Muslim. He's radical. Right. Well, first and foremost, it's, it's really important for us to understand what he means by radical. In the West, when this term is used, radical Muslim or radical Islam, it means someone who is actually prone to violence or someone who is who has the propensity to violence or is violent in his or her actions. That's the connotation that is actually associated with the term radical Islam. So what he's trying to say is that in the normative position for a Muslim is that that particular Muslim is prone to violence with all peoples. And this is his opinion. If you if you keep watching what he says, his, his opinion is that if Muslims had it their way, 
we would uh, we would actually be violent to combatants and non-combatants to to uh, m women and children to anyone who doesn't agree with our ideology. Uh, and the first thing is he's made an assertion. He's na he's now made a claim. Where is the evidence for this claim? Because making points on a podcast is one thing. Not being able to substantiate it with the primary source material, which is the Quran and Sunnah, is something which is actually should not be tolerated in an academic discussion. So from this perspective, Joe Rogan should have stopped everything going on there and said, okay, so what's the evidence for this? Since um, what Joe loves is enlightenment thinking, rationalism, all these kind of things, at every stage where claims are being made, evidence must be given to substantiate those claims. His claim is that Muslims are are prone to violence or radical Islam is Islam. In other words, what is common commonly in the vernacular referred to as terroristic Islam, that is uh, that is uh, synonymous with the Islamic religion. Where's the evidence for that? So that's what I would start by saying because you've made the claim. So what's the evidence for that? And what is I mean? So pretty much you have somebody here who's now you have a platform mm -hmm. that people are trusting you, yeah. right, with this information that you're disseminating. Yeah. And is this guy, is he spewing facts or fairy tales or fiction? What's this guy saying? He's trying to, he's trying to imply, as we know from his viewpoint, that Muslims are prone to violence with non-Muslims. So I said, I said fairy tale, fairy tales, you know, I yeah. mean, still, uh, th this is, this is even, this is, fa many cases, fairy tales aren't dangerous, you know, right. you can tell your kid a fairy tale <laughs> bedtime, but these are, I mean, this stuff is dangerous now. Yeah. Is it? It's absolutely dangerous because if, if people actually buy into this propaganda, then this will affect the life chances of Muslims where people will now compartmentalize the normal, uh, we will say that the, the normative Muslim, the Muslim who's living by the Quran and Sunnah, who's orthodox, who is uh, living by the tenets of Islam and the injunctions of uh, prescribed by the Quran and Sunnah. People will now, according to this, who have no knowledge or have no exposure to Islam, see that person as somewhat of a threat to their way of living, to their person, to, to, their actually, to the actual person. So without evidence, this kind of claim to be actually uh, put on air on a massive podcast like Joe Rogan's podcast is, to be honest with you, a very irresponsible thing for Joe Rogan to acquiesce to and to allow to happen on his podcast. How can he make it right? He can make it right by every time there is a claim like this by one of those antagonists, and I would call them antagonists, or people that are anti-Islam, first and foremost, to ask them what the evidence for that claim is. And secondly, as you mentioned at the beginning of this show, he has to now allow for Muslims to be able to put the argument. Because he's never had a Muslim, pro-Islam, orthodox Muslim, on the show, putting forward the case for Islam and answering the questions and the misconceptions. You ready to go? Yeah. He gives us the call. Mohammed Hijab and Eddie from the Dean Show, we're coming with our geese, Joe. Let's do it. Let's go to the next one. Not always have been... Uh, threatened in that my head is going to come off at any minute, right? My parents grew up and lived there. They didn't die. But once the civil war broke out, then it became lethally dangerous to be Jewish. I mean, we were going to be executed. We left. So you never know when we're going to go from tolerating you to off with the heads. And that's been the history for the past 1400 years. So pretty much he's talking about we just never know when they're going to flip. <laughs> if we can translate it to like that. Right. What do you got to say? So there's two things with this uh, really important things that ought to be really stressed. One is that now he's making it as if Muslims are intrinsically violent and that you don't know when they are going to actually become violent. Uh, the question is, why would that be your assumption of only Muslims? Muslim, there are segments of Muslims, we're not denying that there are some Muslims that are prone to violence, that have been violent, that continue to be violent. But is that an exclusively Muslim problem? That's point one. Number two is, where is, once again, your claim is noticeable by its lack of evidence. So in other words, in order to make this claim, where is your evidence from the Quran and Sunnah? Because once again, you're conflating Islam and Muslims. Islam as a religion, there is enough in the religion to make it patently clear to anyone who has a sincere mind and a pure heart and who's receptive to listening uh, to these arguments that Islam is categorically against the killing of innocent, or let's not even use the word innocent, non-combatant people. Because the word innocent could be said, okay, well, it's subjective. What does the word innocent mean? We are saying non-combatants. What is the evidence of this? A hadith that is narrated by the Prophet Muhammad where it says, Men qatala mu'ahidan lam yarih ra'ihat al-jannah. Whoever kills a non-combatant, non-Muslim will never smell the fragrance of heaven. 
Why have I translated it as non-combatant, non-Muslim? Because this hadith, which is in Bukhari, it's a, a sahih hadith, authentic, has been narrated upon by Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, one of the scholars of Islam, major scholars um, who wrote Fath al-Bari, one of the major commentaries, uh, probably the best to have written about uh, the Bukhari, this, this collection, the most authoritative book of hadith according to Sunni Muslims. He says, a mu'ahad here in this hadith means, a dhimmi, it means, a mu'ahad al mustamin So in other words, any, any uh, non-Muslim who is a non-combatant. That's the summary. So if the Prophet is telling us that you, you will never smell the fragrance of paradise if you, if you attempt to murder, or if you murder a non-combatant, non-Muslim, and this man is saying Muslims are prone to violence, and he's indicating that potentially that violence comes from the Islamic sources, then does that not run counter to this particular hadith? Not regarding, of course, the, the Quran, what it says in chapter 60, verse 8, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا يَنْهَاكُمُ اللَّهِ عَنَ الَّذِينَ لَمْ يُقَاتِلُوكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَلَمْ يُخْرِجُوكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارُكُمْ أَنْ تَبَرُّوهُمْ وَتُقُسِتُوا إِلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الْمُقُسِتِينَ That Allah does not forbid you of being nice and kind to those non-believers who do not take you out of your homes or try and kill you. And that certainly Allah loves those who are just. This particular verse in the Quran is not abrogated. No scholar has said it's abrogated. No mufassir, no exegete uh, applying the hermeneutical approach has said that this verse is abrogated. Therefore, with this verse and this hadith, and of course the many other verses in the Quran like 532, chapter 5 verse 32 and other verses, it's categorically clear that the Islamic position is that it is not allowed it is not allowed for a Muslim to endanger or, or kill or murder a non-Muslim who is a non-combatant. In any case, this runs counter to this man's claim. Now, any other verses that are mentioned in the verbatim word of God, the Quran, where we have intact, tamper-free, tamper-proof, yes. as we had it revealed over 1,400 years ago, we have it. Mm -hmm. There's no other book like it. Yeah. There are references in there, mm -hmm. and there's verses that people will take a lot of times out of context. So how do you now, for the skeptic, maybe Joe or one of his followers, they say, well, what about... And those you verses. Those right. verses. Those verses. How right. do you read those, interpret those verses? Well, there's two things that need to be looked at. We are not denied. Well, first of all, Muslim position is not a pacifistic one. And that has to be made patently clear. That Islam is not a religion of pacifism. In other words, we do believe that there is a scope, an international scope from an international perspective, an international relations perspective, for defensive. And sometimes, historically, there have been preemptive uh, uh, excursions. And uh, that's, that's happened. There's been campaigns. We're not saying that didn't happen, and we wouldn't deny that that happened, that did happen, that is part of the Islamic corpus. There are verses in the Qur'an which encourage, in the context of war, for aggression. There is, for example, in chapter 8, verse number 12 and 13, it says, uh, which is very much um, parroted by a lot of these Islamophobes, which says that, I will put in the hearts of the disbelievers terror, so, you know, chop, the, uh, hit them at the necks and hit them at the, the fingertips. What is this talking about? It's very, very clear that chapter 8 of the Quran, chapter 9, uh, chapter 4, chapter 2, all those places and those uh, places in the Quran which talk about violence reference the context of war. War, it's this only, is combat now. Only combat. And do you know what the evidence of this is? And this is something which, unfortunately, and this man is meant to be an Arab, but I don't think he's familiar with these things. I will challenge anyone actually on this. Yeah, There is no place in the Quran where the word, uh, where, where killing is mentioned, where killing is mentioned of someone who's a non-Muslim without at least the beginning of that particular segment, a reference to qital being made. Now the word qital in Arabic, it necessitates fighting from both sides. It has to have fighting from both sides. Qital means fighting from both sides. Whenever the Quran mentions fighting or killing, it only does so when it's clear that the one who you're fighting is a combatant that is intending to endanger you and endanger your life and endanger your property. Not in the context where that person is a non-combatant. That is clear in the linguistic, um, what you would call the meter, this is called the meter, the Arabic meter of this particular word, qital. It cannot, it cannot mean 
one person one person murdering another person who is a non-combatant. It necessitates in the Arabic language that there is fighting from both sides. So everywhere in the Quran, which talks about fighting, only does so in the context of war. And this is absolutely non-controversial, considering considering that that's that is the foreign policy of almost every, if not every country in the world today. It's absolutely not controversial. But they've made it controversial because they need to stigmatize the other. And today the other is the Muslim. Let's go to the next clip. We got a, we got uh, quite a few to go through. Let's go. You ready for the next yeah. one? Uh, this shirt actually looks good on Joe, doesn't it? It does. Right? It, it, it kind of complements his physique. Yeah. We can get you another one. <laughs> Joe, hopefully when we come down, when he invites mm. Muhammad Hijab and myself will come down or or you can invite him we get you someone else no we need you but to come we need you to come as well we'll, we'll come together inshallah. inshallah let's go to the next one very odd because it's the most regressive it's unbelievable it's it's very it's a really strange position to be a progressive who's reinforcing the ideologies of a regressive culture that's very ancient but what's incredible is that they'll come up with ways to defend this cognitive inconsistency and hence that's part of the ostrich parasitic syndrome that I was mentioning earlier. What, what are some ways that they defend it? So example, uh, let me just give you a few manifestations of ostrich logic. Uh, my friend Muhammad is a very nice guy and he drinks and he fornicates and he's very liberal. So the idea then becomes that as long as I can identify a single exemplar of a Islamic person who does not otherwise uh, adhere to what Islam dictates, then it's not true that Islam is bad. Now, this is this is a manifestation of a more general cognitive bias. Your uh, yeah. feedback on so this? So I would say that. Um, Joe, What's he saying? Well, you sum it up for the average yeah. layman. They're like they can't maybe make out what we're yeah. trying to uh, deduce from here. Right. What What is in, in layman's terms? What message are we getting from this? What he's trying to say that anything in his opinion which complies with his definition of progression is good islam does not apply uh, uh, comply with that therefore islam is bad that's his deduction right he's saying that islam is regressive regressive that means it's in the stone age yes in, in, the, in the in the stone age it's a, it's a medieval religion yeah right so his, he's saying he he makes his point quite often actually he says it's very archaic very medieval very ancient religion this by the way in logic is called the genetic fallacy you, uh, genetic fallacy is basically to say and this is a very it's a textbook in formal fallacy it's one of the first things anyone will learn uh, if they've studied the basics of logic now he makes this point over and over again that this is an ancient religion a very old religion or whatever I mean so what does that in that does that take away depreciate from its truth value because actually democracy is more is is more aged than Islam is Islam with this, uh, the, the the big eye that which we would say that the uh, coming of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam democracy was exercised in the ancient Greek period of time so this was a good maybe a thousand years before Islam or something actually more than that so we're talking about if, if that was the logic you, you're a liberal democrat with small l and small d right you believe in liberalism and you believe in democracy yet liberalism or you can say democracy for sure is an ancient belief and he makes this point once again. So does that make democracy a unuseful way of life? So once again, the genetic fallacy is it doesn't actually yield any positive results. The second thing is here he's allowed for his um, basically, I would say the, the ruler by which and through which he measures, measures truth, the post enlightenment age, which is basically um, after there was a philosophical age in the 17 to let's say 1900s. Um, whereby some philosophers came and they preached certain philosophies of them. Uh, liberalism was refined, uh, you know, lots of republicanism was was defined, re refined. Lots of uh, popular philosophies were kind of refined at that period of time. And he thinks the judge of a good society is that which is complicit with those particular philosophies. My question would be, what's the proof for that? What's the evidence for that? So you've taken for granted that the Enlightenment age is the be all and end all, is the pinnacle of human achievement, is the philosophical peak. Now, what is the objective um, in an objective way? So what is your way of uh, dealing with that? What's, what is your evidence base for that? How can you provide evidence for that? In fact, if you look at the Enlightenment period, most of the philosophers actually disagreed with each other on very core tenets. And that's why you had that conglomerate of different philosophers always uh, disagreeing with each other each other on core issues thus your measure of truth is is really a subjective measure of truth which relies only upon 
I would say, the post-colonial white man's world. And this is very much the way that the colonialist, the British colonialist, the French colonialist, the Ita you know, you could say the Italian colonialist, the German colonialist, all of these European colonialists, the Dutch colonialists, they actually um, justified colonizing lands. And that's how America was actually, in a, in a sense, formed. So if that is the case, my question to you very directly, Joe, would be, how can you prove it? Why, how can you prove your, your implicit assumption here that progression is that which goes towards Western civilization or its understanding of enlightenment, etc.? How can you prove that? Because we can't just take those premises for granted. Don't we see people judging like Islam and the civilization of Islam based on two countries and specifically you have Afghanistan yeah. and Iraq, yeah. which have been like blown back into the Stone Age. Right. So they look at those places where mm. they've been just bombed, mm. you know, and the people who are living peacefully, right? <laughs> and now minding their own business. Yeah. Now we went over there, just turned everything into how many people died over the innocent people. In Iraq, um, the, some of the statistics say 123,000, 125,000 people died. Um, some say it goes up from, they're, they're ranging statistics, some say 125,000, go, it goes up to a million. Um, so there are ranging statistics, but that's a, that's a massive number. Massive, yeah. That's a massive number which cannot be compared to anything. And we're not justifying by anything that the, 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 the terrorists have done. So those terrorists, the Islamic terrorists, how, what they have done in terms of human casualty doesn't compare to uh, yeah. just that one particular war. So you blew you bl you blew up uh, the uh, burned the books and the libraries. You know uh, the everything was just destroyed. And the country's upside down. Absolutely. So people think, okay, well this is Islam. They're backward. But right. I mean, what I mean, are there some modern days examples of some countries yeah. that Muslims are living in? I mean, what what examples do you give? You got Dubai. What do you what right, do you well, Malaysia? Where do you where where, where the, would you give examples? That's a good question. So I would say, generally speaking. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't premise this by saying that the measure of an advanced society is ne necessarily yeah. developmental or economic, right? But even if we did look at economic, even if we did take that as a as a as a kind of uh, measure, there are some cities and some countries now in the Muslim world, like in Malaysia, like in Indonesia, like in Turkey, like in different countries, like you say UAE. These are countries which are growing at a rapid rate. However, who cares? It, it doesn't do anything to prove, reduce, increase the truth value of Islam or any other religion. Uh, look at where America was a good uh, hundred years ago. There was, the, there was the Wall Street crash in the Great Depression. This was literally a hundred years ago. I mean, we're talking about the 1920s and 30s, the Wall Street crash in the Great Depression. Does that mean that the values that you take so, uh, so much for granted were false then and they're true now? Does economic growth and sustainability necessitate truth? I think this is actually something that a lot of people do believe. That if something, uh, if the values of a particular country are good, then the economics will be good. And that's something he said in another segment or one of his guests said it. It's a very false kind of fallacious type logic. China should be uh, at the forefront of our analysis then. Whatever they believe, it must be the truth. Mm -hmm. Because according to many different um, economists, they're saying that ch China will actually overtake America in its, in its overall GDP and... Uh, and will overtake it even militarily in 100 years or 50 years. One more point. What about when Islam was at its, what they call, golden age? Yeah. When you look at Islam was now in Spain and places like this. Right. How advanced, how, pro they say progressive. Was it regressive back then or That's was really the, rest of the, rest of the rest of the world where people were in, in the dark ages? Yeah. What happened if if you use this example? Well, that's, a, that really, that's a really good question because I would I would argue that if you look at, for example, the time period of about 410 AD to 1485 AD, this is what is commonly referred to as the Middle Ages. Yeah, uh, the Middle Ages is also referred to, ironically, as the European Dark Ages. And the reason why they call it that is literally because the Europeans didn't have at that particular time much of a cultural, economic, or philosophical contribution on the world. And in fact, the superpowers of the world were not the Western world. After 1485, there was a massive shift because basically the Europeans found the Americas. Um, and that was the age of the discovery. And the Renaissance also started. The early modern period started. There's lots of different things that started at the same time. But if you think about the period of time that I've just mentioned, the Abbasid Empire, for example, was seen as the strongest human empire in the world. And so if we use this, the same logic, we have to look at the historical timeline. He's, he, one of his arguments, one of the arguments that his, his, his panelists oftentimes make, is that economic growth is a measure of truth. 
Well, if that's the case, we have to look at all of the time, and this is a false premise anyways, but you look at all the time. And the Quran actually informs us of the fact that there will be days and there will be times where non-Muslims will, uh, will be successful, whether it be militarily or economically, and Muslims will be successful economically and militarily. In his, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ These are the days which we alternate between the people. Yes. So in other words, there will be some days which will be prosperous and victorious and other days which will, be, uh, which will not be prosperous mm -hmm. and victorious. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. That does not want to criticize this one segment of the human population that they think is being persecuted. Right. And so, meanwhile, if you think about throughout, currently in the world, which ideology persecutes the most number of other people? So if, if you talk about bloody borders, right? Islam has fought with Buddhists. Islam fights with animists. Islam fights with Jews. Islam fights with Christians. Islam fights with Tibetan monks. Damn, man, he's he just <laughs> makes uh, Muslims are just bullies. They just oh, wow. they're just uh, you know bloody and blood. They're looking for uh, a fight yeah. <laughs> everywhere you go. We uh, Muslims are fighting with Buddhists, Tibetans, uh, Jew, everybody. <laughs> he just started to you know list goes on. What yeah. do you got to say? Well, I would say to that, that that's a really unfair social analysis. In fact, I, I, that's actually very, if anything's going to make uh, us angry is that, because frankly, the first example he gave was a, a ridiculous example. He says Muslims, and to, to paraphrase him, has fought with Buddhists. Muslims has fought with Buddhists. I mean, really? If you look at the situation in Burma, who is fighting with who? Who is the oppressed and who is the oppressor in Burma? Burma is a Buddhist majority country. The Rohingya are a Muslim minority living in Burma. According to the UN, they are the most persecuted people in the world. This is, he said currently, this is current. This is happening today, it happened yesterday, and it's going to happen tomorrow. So he who picked that fight? Exactly, that's a really good question. So who picked that fight? It was a fight that was initiated by the military, the Burmese military, under the command of the Bur Burmese government, and with the support of some Burmese people, I'm being very careful, some Burmese people, and particularly the clerics, the monks. Some monks have come out, and the documentaries are online, it's not, it, it, it's not private, have come out and actually justified th this genocide that's happening now. And what's happening, I've been there myself, I went to Cox Bazaar, which was on the border with Burma. Um, I, and it's on my channel, actually, I've, I've got a video with, with women who I've done personal interviews with in Burma. And, and these women were telling me that they've seen that their, their sons have been thrown into fires. Basically, fires were made by the military. And, and the Burmese government, uh, the Burmese military held the, 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 their sons, their small infant sons, and threw them into fires. And this happened en masse in villages. Whole villages were burnt down. I've, I was a witness to that. And it's on my, it's on my channel. You can, I'll maybe send you a link of that. But it's, it's very clear for everyone to see that actually what's going on is a genocide the other way around and he and then he then he mentions muslims are fighting with jews is this the argument that actually jews are not fighting with muslims because frankly if we look at the situation from the Balfour declaration up until this point in time in israel what's referred to as israel in palestine which we refer to as palestine which is now not recognized as a country yeah the country's been taken over it's been complete and now settlements are being built in the west ba in in that area so and these are, these are Muslim people that are living there, being kicked out of their homes and being persecuted. And in fact, many people would argue, non-Muslims, would fairly argue, looking at it objectively, as, as Joe would say, that actually this is, there's no doubt that the oppressed here are the Palestinians and the, the oppressor are those people that are, uh, are, are pinching uh, the Palestinians from every corner. So th that's what's happening. And then he mentions Christians have fought. Muslims have fought with uh, Christians. Almost every historian that I've read on on the Crusades, by the way, they they see, especially the first and second Crusade, as as a very bloody endeavor, which was uh, obviously initiated by the Christians and was continual. So in other words, con Christians continued doing this. Yet the mention of the Crusades is not mentioned. The colonization of the Americas was one of the most bloodiest wars because it was a series of wars proxy wars and wars in human history the colonization of of spain or uh, by spain of the of, of the americas of south america and of uh, of western european countries to north america this was seen as as one of the most bloodiest things 
that has ever happened in human history. And this is recent history. Look what, how black people were treated in America, enslaved for many, many years and, and, and racially abused and persecuted. And, and a lot of this was pretext using biblical script. Mm -hmm. A lot of people use Genesis chapter mm -hmm. 9, verse 22 to, to show, look, you know, Ham is the son of Noah and he was cursed. And, and therefore, uh, racism is okay. So why is this discussion not coming out? Why is this not being fleshed out? Why is this kind of um, whole scale, like a holistic approach not being taken sociologically and more of a, a wide scale historical um, inquiry being made on this? Why does it have to be very cherry picked, and this is another logical fallacy by the way, examples to try and prove that Muslims are unique uh, in their violence? In fact, if you look at the most um, bloodiest if you look at the bloodiest wars that have ever happened in history, look at the top 10 in terms of casualties, you'll find that the majority of them were done by Europeans and its extensions. So does that mean to say that white people now, white Europeans, are the bloodiest and most violent people in the world? The historical record shows that they are. But is that something in their genetics? We wouldn't make that argument. We would say that's, that would be a, a ridiculous argument. It was circumstantial. It was politically circumstantial. So I would say the same thing. Islam now is being vilified because of the political or geopolitical situation which has happened, which has made, which has which allowed for certain groups to, 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 to form and certain terroristic acts to, to take place. That's politically circumstantial. But if you compare that with what's happened broadly in history, we're very, very clear that actually it's a drop in the ocean compared to the amount of people that have been killed by Europe the Europeans under not only Christianity, but all of those Enlightenment philosophies that Joe loves so much including liberalism, and uh, including <coughs> secularism, and including um, atheism, materialism, uh, that Islam has no, com there's no comparison in terms of casualties. Yeah, it seems like many of these guests, they're, they're not thoroughly educated in this area. Yeah. And they take these headline, they educate themselves um, because they have a certain agenda. And we know that today there's a big industry. People are making a lot of money that's right, that's on, right, yeah. on um, bashing Islam. It's a it's the Islamophobia industry. Mm -hmm. But then you have people that, so let's say, okay, that's coming from you guys, the Muslims, right? Yeah. But people can go and check into this like someone who is genuine and sincere, who's a friend of Joe Rogan's, mm -hmm. right? His name is C.J. Wheelerman. Mm -hmm. He's been on the joe rogan show mm -hmm. he was someone who was also kind of just going along with what you know the tabloids and you know superficial knowledge but he went <coughs> into depth mm. and he wanted to know hold on what is causing these people to go ahead you know a certain fringe element to do whatever extremist ass acts mm. and now he's bringing to light he's saying that no it's not because of islam it is geopolitical. You're mm -hmm. going exploiting these people's lands, their resources. And then he also is now in the forefront, C.J. Right. Wheelerman. Wow. Guest on the Joe Rogan show. is a friend of Joe Rogan's. Uh, he's also now coming out and speaking on behalf of the Burmese people. Anyone who is a sincere, genuine person, who has a heart, right, who really is out for justice, for truth, mm -hmm. right, who's not just trying to maliciously spread hate and whatnot, mm -hmm. He's going to see these things are these are these. This is a rabbit hole. You, you go down and mm. you see it's mm. like, wow, you know, these are things that I don't really hear in the mainstream. C.J. Wheelerman, he's someone now who brings to the forefront the oppression, the genocide that's going against the Burmese people. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the, uh, the Zionists, with the, the Palestinian, the oppression that's going on there. Mm -hmm. And I really I really think that Joe Rogan, if he starts to bring on people like yourself, People like, I, I don't think CJ's been on his show again mm. uh, because he had an epiphany. He's like, you know, started to really truth seek and he went down this direction. I don't know if he'll have him back again. But if he, if he brings on people like that, like yourself and others, he'll have more of a balanced approach. Yeah, I, I hope so. Well, yeah. I do. I, I really hope. Because the thing is, at the moment, his panelists, his choice of panelists have been very, very select, yeah. selective. I mean, it's, he's chosen people that literally it, are anti-muslim ex-muslim or and it shouldn't be like our yeah. team against your team it's we're like one that. humanity exactly yeah right it shouldn't be like okay now you know they're the other they're the bad guys and now we're trying to pack all the just stack all the chips against them so i bring on these selective guests mm. the, what should be the criteria here mm. what do we should what should we looking for for truth no right, right. for justice for right. truth yeah and how do you how would how would you recommend to joe right now to ascertain that truth i'll say to him i i genuinely believe from what i've seen with joe and with his with his um guests especially the ones who talk about islam um 
that he's asking from a sincere position of, I'm not going to say this in a, in a derogatory sense, but of ignorance. Like he doesn't know something he wants to know. And he's sincere about that. Um, what I would say to him is that don't rely upon that testimony because what, what would be more conducive for you is to pick up uh, a translation of the meaning of the Quran, read at least from chapter 50 up until chapter 114, which is a, is a section called Al Mufassal. It will give you an understanding of the core tenets of Islam. Um, if you can read the whole book uh, in, in the translation of the meanings, I'll say to him, listen to our side of the argument uh, as well. Listen to what we do. Um, try and put yourself in a position because Joe, you're an advocate. He's an advocate of taking, a, taking himself out of, the com of his comfort zone. Yeah. He's, he's a martial artist. He believes in a sustained growth cannot be achieved unless you take yourself out of your son comfort, uh, comfort mm -hmm. zone. And the same thing applies ideologically. You will not be able to grow intellectually until you surround yourself with people you disagree with. Yeah. And that's what we do on a, on a regular basis in the UK. We go to a place called Speaker's Corner and we, we speak with people we disagree Hyde with. Hyde Park, right? Hyde Park, Speaker's Corner. And, and that is a very, it's actually a, a liberating experience because we're able to flesh, flesh these issues out and take the elephant out of the room. So I would recommend for you, for your own intellectual growth, and for your own, I would even say spiritual, psycho-spiritual growth. I, I like that. And he can relate to that because in jujitsu, right, right, if you're just training with the same training partners, right, yeah. you're beating out on them, right, you're not, mm. you're not uh, challenging yourself, putting yourself in uncomfortable positions, not, right? Yeah, exactly. You're not going to grow. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. Let's go. Uh, let's continue on. How's that? We got yeah, a few yeah. more. Let's, let's uh, go through these. Is that let people who are non-Islamic, who are fleeing those areas oh, at the front of the queue first. But isn't right. that isn't that religious persecution? I mean, or it, it, at the very least, it's prejudiced, right? I mean, you're 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 singling people out because of their ideology or because of what religion they're from, not because of their past behavior or any predictors whatsoever about their future behavior. But we do have some statistical regularity about what types of values those guys are going to come with. So I'm not suggesting we close the door. Right, but wouldn't that, in a way, I mean, just to play devil's advocate, sure, sure. wouldn't that, in a way, kind of put the Muslims in Toronto who do immigrate, which would have picked that city, who try to immigrate to Canada, in the same sort of a position that your family was in, in Lebanon, where you were hiding the fact that you were Jews? No one has an inalienable right to Im immigrate anywhere, correct? So if you wish to immigrate to the West, then leave every single syllable that constitutes a belief, attitude, position, value that is contrary to ours at the door and then welcome in my brother. But man, we isn't that a crazy thing to say to someone whose entire life and their ideology is a, a big part of their identity and who they are, like how they view the world. So that, that's a, the structure for which they interface with other human beings. But if those values, so let, let's suppose they I were- I agree with you yeah. in a way. I agree with you overall when I talk about the entire human population that it would be wonderful if we did that. But from individual to individual, we know about the trials and tribulations that people go through in a day-to-day -day life. And religious freedom and a religious ideology in many cases helps people get through the pains of life. It helps them get through the struggles. So now what you have here, I, I would say this guy is an anti-constitutionalist. Right. Because in our constitution, yeah. you have what? Freedom of religion. So can we say that this guy is saying basically mm -hmm. you, you can come to America but leave your Islam? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what he's, he's trying to say, isn't it? Yeah. What do you have to say about this? Well, I, I think that that's more in line. I'm not saying this guy is this, but this, that's more in line with a fascist belief rather than um, a liberal belief, frankly. Because fascism comes from the, the word fascio, which literally means to bundle everyone up together and to, to rule over them with the same ideology. So in other words, uh, a uniformity in the way everyone, uh, what everyone believes is required in fascism. Uh, people like Carl Schmitt talked about this, one of the fascist philosophers, uh, Nazi philosophers. So what he's saying is, is more in line with, with that what, than it is in line with liberalism. To be fair to Joe though, he did actually disagree with the sentiment uh, which is which is good. Obviously. The good was com good was coming out. Joe was standing yes. up. I mean, for some some of the American principles, right? Right. Uh, he was saying I was trying to play a devil's advocate, but I think his good side that was coming out. Yeah, he was yeah, trying yeah, to was you know. Out. I think he's he's reluctant to disagree with his guest. Yeah. Right. He's reluctant to disagree with him, but he was he's playing this 
devil advocate, but he was he was saying I disagree. I agree with parts of it, which implied he disagreed with parts of what this man was saying. Sometimes you got to change your friends, brother, if you want to grow. Also, <laughs> <laughs> you just can't be around the same people. It's They're true. gonna bring you down. It's true. It's this true. guy's spreading hate, man. It's true. Yeah. He's saying basically. Do you know what the, the significance of what he's saying is that people who are fleeing persecution because that's what's happening. They're f they're fleeing. Pers they're Muslims who are fleeing persecution, that are dying, uh, women and children who are coming. Uh, what if this man had it his way? Because he was sort of talking about how Muslims would have it their way. If this man had it his way, we'd have to um, apostate from our religion in order to to enter uh, into a safe zone. Yeah, sounds very constitutionalist <laughs> or pro constitution. I don't think so. I think this man is very, as you've said correctly, anti constitution. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Yes, I haven't been everywhere, so I'm pretty well traveled. I just I've never been anywhere like my time in the Middle East where where I've seen not everybody but certain people value human life so little so little okay maybe he's talking about the people where he visited there but is am, am I understanding this right that is he classifying Muslims as people that he's never seen such a group of people as Muslims who who don't have value for human life. He was talking about Middle Eastern, uh, Mi Middle Eastern as Arabs, yeah. but generally speaking, I think the conversation went on to include all Muslims. Yeah, and the implicit or the subtextual uh, thing there was that Islam was the cause of this. Well, this is what they believe, and this is what was kind of echoed before with the other guest. Um, the point being is this: I mean, he's saying that he's never seen a people that have. Um, not valued human life so little. Well, I don't see how that could be the case when you have police officers shooting black people in this country, left, right, and center, for racial reasons. I don't, I don't see how that could be the case when America, since 2015, which is some th two, three years ago, um, was responsible for 1,358 drone strikes in Afghanistan alone. I don't see how that's the case when Stephen Green, one of the people that was in Iraq, here, one of the um, w one of the human beings that was an ex drone member of Iraq, he killed and raped a fourteen year old Iraqi girl. And when asked the reason why, he said, "I don't see that he that Iraqis are human beings," and that is the essence of dehumanization. I don't see how he thinks that Middle Easterners are literally unique in their belief that human life is is le is less. When actually the reason why the majority of human life has or blood has been spilt in the Middle East is actually because of America itself. 123,000 people have died in Iraq alone. So his point is absolutely null and voided. He's shooting himself right in the foot with that because frankly, what America has done in the last 100 years in terms of war, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and more, and, and, and you know the drone strike campaigns is unmatchable. It's absolutely unmatchable. But the thing is this, I think they differentiate in their minds between people who are close by and people who are f further away. Because they don't necessarily see the drones and they don't necessarily see the people being killed, they don't necessarily have that intimate, empathetic um, relationship with, 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 with the rest of humanity. What we're saying is, before you point the finger at Middle Easterners and Muslims and all these people, realize very clearly that there are fingers pointing back at you. And be introspective because this is a very unfair sociological uh, analysis. Before we go to the next one, me as a as a, a Muslim mm. who loves Islam, mm. submission to the will of God. Mm. A Muslim is one who submits to the will of God, who loves Jesus, who loves Moses, all the prophets that God has sent with the same message: worship only the Creator, not the creation. Do good deeds. One of the most, one of the first things I think about. Three, and then we'll go to the next one real quick. Is is the first thing that one of the cases that will be judged on the day of judgment is someone who has blood on their hands. And that's scary. I know it's scary for me. I'm sure it's scary for you. Absolutely. I, I, you don't want to come in front of the Creator, in front of Allah, in front of God with it, with human life on your hand. We know that, right? Yes, that yes. That is going to be something where you don't want to take a chance, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have... The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who shows us through our example that a woman, she'll be thrown in the hellfire because she neglected to feed her cat. Allah. Her cat. She oppressed the cat. And, and that, what does that teach us? That wow. teaches the value of not yeah. just human life, of yes. animal life. And then on top of that, hmm. you have the mercy of Islam 
that the person who went, it was a prostitute, was yes, it? Yes. Who gave water to the dog. To the dog, right? Look at them. See, so these people are ignorant of Islam. Yeah. You know, they're they're. In fact, this other guy who was saying that Prophet Muhammad hates dogs. You're a not black dog. Yeah, I mean, Muhammad hated dogs, but he particularly hated black dogs. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, that hadith has no place in his analysis. Yeah. So this knocks yeah. that out. We don't even have to go to that. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next one. Um, no, you can slavery. I mean, this is this is the horror of of. Abrahamic religion generally. I mean, these are this is why we know these are books were not authored by a moral genius. The Bible and the Quran can't give you a basis to resist slavery. Take it away. So this is um, this is really interesting because Sam Harris has actually written a book called The Moral Landscape. And in that book called The Moral Landscape, he writes in a footnote, in one of the ending chapters. I forget wh which which chapter exactly, but he writes. Um, and this is a kind of paraphrase of what he says. He says that there is no neurobiological way of ascertaining uh, truth and falsehood. In other words, objective morality, according to Sam Harris, cannot be ascertained on the atheistic, materialistic worldview. This is not just Sam Harris's opinion. This is the opinion of Richard Dawkins, of Jacques Derrida, of Bertrand Russell, of Nietzsche, of most postmodernist uh, atheist philosophers. Uh, that actually objective morality cannot be ascertained. What's really interesting is that on the one hand where they make this patently clear that there is no philosophical epistemological base for um, basically believing uh, in objective morality, they'll make arguments which are moral against religion. And this is one of the arguments that they made. So uh, he makes, he says that, that slavery and whatnot. Let's take for granted, let's, let's say for the sake of argument that he's right about, this, uh, about slavery generally speaking. Even if he was completely right, that would do absolutely nothing for the case of atheism and absolutely nothing for disproving Islam. However, he is wrong on that because of one very simple verse in the Quran, which most of the children, uh, our children have memorized in Surah Al-Balad in chapter 90 of the Quran, where it simply says, وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا الْعَقَبَ فَكُّ رَقَبَ What do you know of the good way? What would make you know what the good way is? Freeing slaves is the good way. His exact terminology was that there is nothing within or inside or outside of the scriptures which allows for the resisting of slavery. The Quran says very clearly that actually, What would make you know what the good way is? Freeing slaves is the good way. What he is saying, because he is, I believe, theologically uh, illiterate. I don't think he's actually someone who reads books, um, theological books, Quran, Sunnah, Hadith and these things. I don't think he actually even looks at the Bible too deeply. I think he makes sociological cases and generalizes them on the religion. Um, and that's very very much the nature of what he does. He never quotes the Quran. You'll never really see this guy quoting the Quran. Sam Harris. Sam Harris doesn't really quote the Quran. I've never seen him. I've never once seen him quoting the Quran because he knows muddy water for him. He's not trained on this. He shouldn't talk about this. this is, he is what they call an ultra crepidarian. He's a non-specialist talking about something which does not concern him. He's completely talking about something which is out of his lane. When he does the same thing with philosophy, it's the same thing. He, he's, he's a non-specialist in philosophy, non-specialist in theology, but he talks about both of those matters as if he is an authority on those two matters. Um, so here, he said that the, the Quran, and I'm not talking about the Bible now, but we're talking about the Quran specifically, has, there's nothing in it that would allow us to resist slavery. So he would not be able to, um, basically, just he would not be able to, um, explain away that verse, which is a non-abrogated verse of the Qur'an. Moreover, I guess what he's trying to say is, because there are verses of the Qur'an which talk about what your right hand possesses, and um, and these things, and the, 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 the ahadith, the various ahadith in the seerah, which shows us that there were slaves at the time of the Prophet, and we're not denying that that's the case. Absolutely, there were slaves at the time of the Prophet. We are saying that the objective of Islam... The whole world, I mean, the whole world at that time... It, it, absolutely. Well, a slavery ended in America in 1865. In, in Britain in 1807. Um, and you can, you, that's legally. Once again, if we take a step back and say, what is slavery? Does it, uh, the international, I think it's called the International um, Anti-Slavery Organizations. Organize, they, they actually said that slavery is defined as, it includes child labor, human trafficking, uh, um, prostitution. They've said these things. If, if we consider these factors and we're very serious about those definitions, and I would say, I would claim that the West is actually more involved and engaged with slavery than any other uh, part of the world. And I think that now, if you really care, if you really want to make a difference, 
since we live here, that's something that's not talked about. That's yeah. like our little secret, America's secret Absolutely, here, yeah. that there are child sex slave rings Absolutely. in our country right, right. now. Up to 300,000 boys and girls are sold in the United States every year, and many of them don't make it out of the industry alive. There are only 99 known survivors from the state of Texas in the last 20 years who've managed to escape sexual slavery. When we think of the most horrific of crimes, the ones so morally repugnant and barbaric, you know, the widespread ones that make you question humanity, it can help us cope to believe they happen somewhere else, somewhere far away. That's why this weekend's FBI prostitution sting and capture of over 150 pimps was so disturbing. Over 100 children rescued. Sexual slavery here at home. How does it still happen? Right. So now you want to go ahead and do some social good. Yeah. Joe Rogan should step up. Sam Harris should step up. Talk about human trafficking. And talk about human trafficking that's mm -hmm. happening right here in our backyard. Yeah. But no, you got to go talk about, you know, this, <laughs> this that, the yeah. other. Absolutely. Point the finger that way so yeah. we don't have to really talk about what's going on at home. It's really interesting because Polaris said that. Polaris is one, I think it's, it's called Polaris. One of the organizations, they said that. America is engaged in slavery. The majority of people that they enslave in human traffic in human trafficking forms is that are actually people of uh, ethnic minority descent, so black people, etc. Those people that are human uh, are engaged in the process of human trafficking, who are human, who are trafficked, are actually people of ethnic minorities. So they they are actually oppressing minorities, enslaving people, going back to what they used to be do the 1865 days, and talking to us about uh, slavery. Islam is. The, I would put this very candidly on the on the record one of the the objectives of uh, islam is to do away with the institution of slavery the the mechanism by which and through which it attempted to do this which is what i was saying before was an incremental gradualist method it wasn't an instant abolition and we know from history that frankly when abolitions are attempted just like in this country when the abolition was attempted of alcohol people rebel against it very quickly if something as deep and as economically important as the institution of slavery is interwoven into the economic fiber of a society, it's not possible for you to pull the rug under someone's foot. So in other words, what Islam came with was an incre incremental method using different things, and of them is zakat. Because in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9 of the Quran, one of the, there are nine things, or eight or nine things that are mentioned in the, in the verse which talks about zakat, and one of them was wafir riqab, the people who, is, who are enslaved. So in other words, since zakat is one of the five pillars of Islam, and since the five pillar, this, this particular pillar must be continued until the day of judgment, we believe, then the, there must have been a certain amount of money always designated for the freeing of slaves. But of course, Sam Harris doesn't know this. Another thing which is really interesting is chapter 24, verse 33 of the Qur'an which explicitly says that if, a, if at that particular time, well, it's obviously not, um, not applicable to us, at that particular historical time period, uh, something called mukataba can be done. Mukataba is where you literally have someone who's enslaved, and then they say to their slave owner, they say to their slave owner, I want to be free, and I will ransom myself. Okay? That person is not a criminal. That person is not someone who's done anything. According to chapter 24, verse 33, and you can look at, for example, Tafsir al-Qurtubi, or other tafsir, like exegesis, that explicitly say that the, there's an opinion that says, and this is a strong opinion, going back to the Sahaba and the companions of the Prophet, if this particular indentured servant, because they're not really slaves in the colloquial sense, because you think of slaves like racial slavery, we've never had that in Islam. That's never been part of Islamic. Never. Never, ever. Racial stuff, it's the, the, the Quran is very... That's what people think. That's what they have in their heads. That we're talking about indentured, because at the time there was no prisons. So these people were put into, uh, into homes, and imprisoned as if it was a prison, right? Um, so that per particular person, if they demand, yeah, if they demand from the, the slave owner to be freed, then according to Tafsir al-Qurtubi, and according to the Sahaba that are related uh, by this Tafsir, they must be freed. Even if the, the slave owner, or you can say the, 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 the one who's the prisoner, the, 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 the one who's imprisoning this indentured servant, declines it, this person can go to uh, a qadi, can go to a judge and, and uh, forcefully be, um, uh, be liberated or emancipated. So in other words, 
Islam, I would argue, is the only ancient system which allowed for the freeing of people which were either slaves, indentured servants or otherwise. There's nothing else in the history of man that went out of its way in order to get people out of the shackles of slavery and into um, and emancipated, generally speaking, whether it be Muslim or not Muslim. What comes to my mind, is it um, Zayd ibn Haritha? Mm. Was it, am I saying the right name, where when he was freed mm -hmm. and then he had a chance to go back to his father, to his family, he chose to stay, mm -hmm. you know, out of the love, mm -hmm. you know, out of... Uh, the love that he had for Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him yeah. so you have a when you put yourself when you take yourself living in today's 2018 today's age right and then you take your back yourself back 1400 years ago when the whole world everybody is immersed in slavery absolutely is a everyone. Yeah. but then Islam came to free the necks of the slaves right absolutely so if Islam just came and said Sla slavery is eradicated. It wouldn't Pe work. It wouldn't work. You got it people invested work. with millions, mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, in slave business. Absolutely. But then what you're saying here is now, if I'm correct, now in every which way you turn, mm -hmm. it just made the road that now it, it penetrated the hearts. Yeah. So people gave this up Absolutely. from the love of their hearts. Absolutely. Not like the, it was forced in this country. And to this day, mm -hmm. people are like, these people should be slaves, right? And you have all this racism. Mm -hmm. Is this correct? Yeah, but there, there are certain s situations where people will be forced to, to free slaves. For example, in Islam, if someone um, had sexual intercourse with their wife in Ramadan, they have to free a slave. If someone does dhihar, which is mentioned in chapter 58 of the Quran, which they call their wives, that they say that you're not, you're, you're basically not, you're like my mother. In other words, you're not sexually compatible with me or something. It's a very specific kind of insult. Free. They have to free, free slaves. Go. Yeah, if they did, um, if, if they did an oath, yeah. they have to free. So there's so many things in Islam which you're forced to free slaves if you do certain things. Then these slaves also slaves right. become governors, and they become scholars, and yeah. they become like you absolutely know, had people of high prestige. People will not understand this, but some people, and because we just said that, for example, if someone was enslaved or an indentured servant, indentured really, servant, that's really what it, yeah, yeah, that's what they were. They were indentured servants. If they were in in the house of someone who was imprisoning them, and they had the rights over them, let's say, uh, and they decided that they wanted to do mukataba, which is this. Um, basically, it's, it's, it's a ransom. They're ransoming, ransoming themselves. They want to be freed. Uh, and they had that opportunity and they didn't take it. The question is, why would those people not take it? A lot of the, the, the particular slaves at that time were indentured servants. They didn't take the opportunity because they, they were getting free accommodation. Yes. That and that's why a lot of them continue to be Mamalik. Like the Mamluk Empire was actually... Um, the Mamluks, there was two Mamluks, one in Egypt and one in um, India. But the ones in Egypt and in India, both of those was, were, were of a slave car, or, or, or a tribe or, or a slave um, a socioeconomic grouping. So they were socioeconomically the lowest of the low, yet they were made into the highest uh, of the high. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same as the, ex the Western experience. A lot of people think they generalize history. So, okay, what, what happened in the transatlantic uh, slave trade where you had black people shift over from West Africa? Yeah. That's, that's the same thing as what happened with Islam. It's not. Okay, before we go to the next one, people are automatically going uh, to see what's going on with this insane state, yes. right? They use these yes. fringe uh, um, elements and then some things in Libya. Yeah. What do you say to that? I say to that, I mean, it's really, really interesting. The I IS, I Islamic State, we shouldn't call it that. We should call it um, Daesh or something, that whatever they want to call themselves. How about but the insane state? In state that sounds I good, yeah. Insane. <laughs> <laughs> Those particular individuals, first and foremost, I've never seen uh, such an extreme fringe in my whole life to the extent whereby I, I watched an interview in Arabic with one of the, um, I'm not going to mention his, their names, but they're, let's say they're, they're of the same ilk as Osama bin Laden, right? Mm -hmm. They're of the same ilk, meaning they have the same kind of uh, th they believe in the same things and one of their leaders said we don't consider this is exactly what he said he said we don't we call um, we call this group back to Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah so they don't consider them Sunni Muslims some scholars that s s don't consider this particular faction it's called Khawarij Muslims they don't, some sc scholars have said that um, at all so, so that's one thing those people who have said that they don't consider they're enslaving, and this is what this person said in the interview, they're enslaving their women. So in other words, 
That particular, it's another faction in the Assyrian war, which is, let's say, associated with extremism. That other faction was associated, he's saying, the person who's, who's in charge of that faction, that they're enslaving our woman. What does that show? It shows, actually, to be frank, that no one sees these people as doing something in line with Islam, not even Osama bin Laden himself, and I'm saying this on the record, not even him. And we know that what he stands for and all that kind of stuff is completely against mainstream orthodox Islam, according to all of the institutions of Islam. But not even he would see what they're doing is in line with Islam. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, I could mention names and all these kind of things, but we won't go into that. Uh, we won't go into that discussion. But the point is, this is such a fringe element of Islam that it's really not worth mentioning as a point of reference. Yet Sam Harris consistently mentions it as some kind of point of reference. It's academically disingenuous because, frankly, there are institutions in Islam, in the Islamic world. All of the institutions, you know, one thing that has united all of the Muslims against them is ISIS. There's nothing that has united all the Muslims against them more than ISIS has. But they still pre keep bringing up this fringe element. Every Muslim dirty tricks. Yeah. These are dirty Every tricks. Muslim organization from India to Saudi Arabia to Egypt to Saudi uh, to uh, all of these Mauritania all of the centers of intellectual power in the Islamic world, which he's not even familiar with. I'm sure Sam Harris is not familiar with those places and those institutions. All of them have categorically condemned ISIS. All of them. So this, there is a consensus on this issue. Yeah. And yet he's using it as an example. So you're actually disregarding all of the institutional, um, what you would call fatwas, religious rulings and, and verdicts of everybody in the Muslim world all of any scholar worth his, uh, you know, any scholar in the Muslim world has said the same thing. Yeah. So how can we ignore all of that and say, okay, well, these, these, this band of people. And Libya, the same thing, because obviously Libya and the thing have the yeah. same ideology. Libya, th there's ISIS in, in Libya. So we're killing two birds with one stone with this. Because frankly, the, the ISIS ideology is so far removed from uh, mainstream Islam that absolutely everybody has condemned them. Yeah, I don't see how he, that that has flown above his head. They kill more Muslims. Absolutely, yeah. They actually have done more harm than any two Muslims. Yes. Uh, before we go to the next point, I mean, there was an uh, FBI released some data talking about that the uh, book that most of them were found uh, carrying with them was a showing how ignorant of Islam this group, the insane state. Uh, is of Islam yeah. a dummy's guide for understanding Islam? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so this is uh, you know really bizarre when you hear these things. For people who are just tuning in, and they're wondering, uh, we got uh, our uh, Redzovic Jiu Jitsu. We're reaching out to our brother Joe Rogan, hopefully, so he can invite some scholars onto his show and give the Muslims perspective, have a fair and balanced approach to these very important topics. Because of, again, once again, these things help fuel the division they help feed into the hate the misunderstanding and that leads to the violence we've seen a lot of it we can discuss that more towards the end let's go to the next one you ready inshallah inshallah called bida bida spell that b i d a i think it might have an h on it i'm not sure uh, but i don't speak arabic and really the idea is that there are no innovation not have any innovation no. not the innovation that they already use like toyota trucks yeah the the, the like for example like the king, king of saud had a hell of a time uh, right, okay, so Saudi Arabia was founded by uh, the Ibn Saud family in... So th this is very interesting. I mean, wh you have um, Joe Rogan, who has a lot of knowledge in many different areas. Yes, he does. You know, yeah. He's one of the best uh, fight commentators. If you want to talk about jiu-jitsu or mixed martial arts, he's an expert there. Yeah. And obviously, we're assuming that he wants to learn. So yeah. if you learn, you grow. But now when you have someone like this, he comes on... And he's just so, you know, with the, he's got the British, he's got an accent like you, he's from, <laughs> yeah. from, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and, and you're laughing because you've dedicated your life to this dean, to this way of life, to studying Islam, to learning, to growing. How do you feel when you have someone, when you see someone like this coming off like, man, he's like, you know, Mr. Sheikh, you know, we call, he's a scholar, like he's, you know, he's really uh, educating Joe. Joe's going to him for the knowledge. Well, first of all, I, I wouldn't say I dedicated my life. Wallahi, if I was anything <laughs> like that, I would, I would wish to have done that. Uh -huh. Wallahi, that's first and foremost. But secondly, this guy, he's trying to use the word bid'ah. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he didn't know how to pronounce it. He didn't know what it was. He didn't know how to spell it. He said he doesn't know the Arabic. Um, and then he falsely 
<laughs> he falsely gives a false definition, or he gives a false definition to Joe Rogan, who swallows it wholesale, and then he accepts it without questioning it, and then he kind of attacks Islam based on it. I would say this is, this is not the way to educate yourself on any topic. It really isn't. The what he was trying to say was bid'ah. And he, what he's trying to say here is that bid'ah is actually um, an innovation of any kind. So a technological innovation. And he's trying to imply that Muslims are averse to technological mm -hmm. innovation. Of course, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha is uh, of the Prophet Muhammad. He, she said that he said, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي دِينِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ Whoever innovates in our religion, what's not in it, then it is rejected. So this is a way of like preserving the religion, yeah. right? It's all religious stuff. Mm -hmm. It's only it only relates to to religious um, injunctions. So in other words, we, we cannot invent a new religious injunction or, or put into the religion of Islam what's not it, in it because we believe Islam is perfect, it's complete. The Quran says in chapter five, verse three: "Aliyom akmal tu lakum dinakum wa atmam tu alikum naamati wa radi tu lakum Islam dinah." So I've perfected your religion. I have completed my favor upon you, and I've made Islam your religion. So it's not a matter of uh, of technological, and this is such a blunder. I mean, yeah. it's such a blunder that I can't believe that he's got someone like this on the show, mm -hmm. uh, educating him on a very important topic. Um, and then he's swallowing it all up wholesale. It's really, it's actually quite embarrassing. It, it is. So now if the person is making a major blunder here, imagine all the other mistakes and you're swallowing them whole. And exactly. then not just that, it's different. You guys, it's dangerous. Okay, you guys having a conversation, then you mm -hmm. go and spew it. But you got a massive audience now. Yeah. It's true. And it just doesn't stop there. It continues on. He just continues on. We we got uh we we'd be here all day. Yeah. You know, going through I mean, it. we've seen so many blunders that I mean I've, it's just one example of it. But it's such a blunder, to be yeah. honest with you. It's such a blunder. Let's get through a couple more and then we'll uh close it up, give some good advice. Hopefully uh Joe Rogan this will get to him and he'll uh have a open mind to yeah. go through these things. And this is this is all in the essence of reaching out to him and his audience so for genuine people who are sincere who really want to know they come into the muslim because that's what we're dedicated the dean show is dedicated to help clear up these misconceptions and deliver the truth to you about islam and bringing you experts who know islam live islam instead of some guy who's maybe reading a cereal box getting some headlines and he's coming out with a nice uh, the, the 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 accent kind of pulls you in right? yeah, yeah in whatever team that we're on right and when you're on a team that has uh in uh, arguably in 2017 the most archaic mainstream ideology that's that's islam right i mean if you you stop and think about how ancient is it how uh in its practices the way um especially when it's in used in radical ways the way women are forced to dress the way in Saudi Arabia, I think up until really recently, they weren't allowed to drive, right? Now they're allowed yeah, to drive. Yeah, within the last two or three years. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of like stuff in it that we would think of as being a part of a bygone era of human beings. Except for a little bit. What do you guys say? Well, first and foremost, I mean, he made the same genetic fallacy. As I said before, he, he repeats this argument quite often. It's an archaic religion. It's an ancient religion. This is called the genetic fallacy it's a logical informal fallacy which means that you're you're looking at the origins of where something came from in order to show that it's false that's not necessarily a way in which you can prove something is true or false and, and moreover he was actually inaccurate in his conceptualizing of islam as the most archaic mainstream um uh, uh, mainstream ideology the most arch in fact democracy as i've mentioned before <laughs> And the idea of de uh, demos and kratia, which are two Greek words meaning people power, originated much before the Prophet Muhammad's coming. So that's actually false from a historical perspective, it's false philosophically, it's false uh, on every level. But then he went on to talk about women, uh, women's dress, which, he, which you I think you've covered it before, but we can kind of talk about it once again. Mm -hmm. And he said this more than once. Whenever he talks about, and I've, I've noticed this, whenever he talks about Islam, he's got this two or three things that he talks about. It's the fact that it's an ancient religion, the fact that uh, he says radical elements, not being specific at what is radical about it or what he thinks is radical, we're not giving ev evidence. And then he talks about women's dress. And he's been known and shown to uh, be quite derogatory and uh, offensive, frankly, with his, his insults. Uh, of Muslim women's dress. 
The question is, on atheism, and I don't believe he's a person of religion anyways, on atheism, who d he dictates what, who should wear what? It's all a social construct at the end of the day, right? No one can prove that women can wear this or should wear that or should wear denim jeans or should wear tight uh, jeggings or, you know what I'm saying, a, 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 a mini skirt or whatever it may be. If you look at the sociological landscape in the Western world, there is this conception that the more a woman shows, the more she's in fact free and liberated. Well, this conception is actually um, very much commodifying and objectifying of women anyways. And you could say that the capitalistic enterprise in the Western world has forced women to actually, uh, actually forced pressured and influenced women on every level to wear certain things which would be more economically, uh, would, which would help the econo economy actually bolster itself. So in other words, you, one could make the argument that the fact that the woman has to take off clothes in order to, uh, to, to actually fit into a sociological norm uh, that has been constructed by certain people, probably men in the patriarchal society, that shows itself that women have been forced to take off their clothes. So if you have a problem with women being forced to put on or take off clothes, then once again, you should address the same issue as, frankly, even radical feminists address, which is the comm commodification um, of women, which leads to rape. Some say that this is actually a direct causation, not just a correlation. It, it leads to rape. It leads to different kinds of social ills. It, it leads to objectifying women, men seeing uh, having entitlement. It leads to a range of different social problems. And he has not um, really said it. What he's doing is, is called a, an aesthetic value judgment. He's looking at something saying, I don't like the way that looks. Why? Because you're not used to it. You live in California or you live in Boston. I don't know where he lives. And he's used to seeing certain aesthetic things. Things look normal to him. Things look abnormal to him. You know, we had that. You can have a drink of coffee. You can have a drink of tea. You might not like coffee. You might not like... Who cares? It's your subjective opinion. Have you got anything to substantiate to us that women ought to wear this? Women ought to wear that? Or is it just the fact that you're a post-colonial uh, white man living in the Western Hemisphere that thinks that women should wear denim, uh, jeans and short skirts, and uh, you're trying to enforce that on, on a different part of the world, which has religious precepts, which encourages women to be more modest. If it is, this, if it is the latter, then you have no case, my friend, I would say to him, right? yeah. really and truly, you have no case, my friend. However, uh, your opinion is as valuable as, uh, as it is for you. So it's subjective, it's, it's your subjective opinion. You're entitled to have it, no problem. But... I wouldn't go as far as to insult now women uh, that are wearing something that you're not used to seeing. And there's a ton of, I mean, there's a ton of videos mm. out there and he can go to the Muslim woman himself yeah. and hear what they have to say. They feel liberated. Absolutely. They feel free now, mm -hmm. right? Be, uh, dressing in this modest way. There's a quote that really struck home Norman Fickelstein. Right, I don't know if right. you, you've heard him. He quotes that people who came over no. to america at first they had three layers of clothing right right and they saw the natives on the land they were pretty much almost you know had nothing on and they thought they were pretty much savage right then norman dr norman fickelstein mm. he says now how dare we right. how dare we insult wow you know mm. the muslim women right mm -hmm. and now we're half naked and they're dressed he's talking about the muslim women and we're saying that they're you know, backwards. Something is paraphrasing. That's, that's a really interesting thing. Is go, that's from Dr. Norman Fickles. You've heard of him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, he's very active. He's a, he's a good person also for Dr. Joe Rogan to come on. He would be brilliant. To he's talk absolutely, about. He's brilliant. Yeah. He's excellent. Especially on his um, anti-Zionist thing. Uh, yeah. He's got some. If he, wants a, if he wants an expert in this area because he talks, yeah. he has some Zionist friends that come on. Mm. If he really and wants he's Jewish. to. And uh, Huh? He's Jewish as well. And he's Jewish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, his family, they were from the Holocaust. The Holocaust. yeah, yeah. yeah. That is a fair and balanced approach. Someone who doesn't mainstream media mm -hmm. scared to touch him, right? Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan, he's independent. Why don't you bring him on? Yeah, absolutely. It'll be brilliant. Yeah. But I was going to say, what, what Joe Rogan's um, commentary boils down to is actually not only just an aesthetic value judgment, but actually a post-colonial narrative, which, which really is that the white man wants the rest of the world in his image. Like, the, the, when I say the white man, I'm not talking about the, the, the color of the skin. I'm talking about the post-colonial archetypal um, man who has seen that the Western experience is, is the pinnacle uh, of human achievement. They want the, the rest of the world in their image. Moreover, what's interesting is, as I think I was mentioning to you before, 
they're actually we've we've talked about nuns. We know nuns wear hijab in a sense. I mean, they wear the equivalent of a hijab. What's not known is that Haredi Jewish women. If you look and just go online and check Haredi Jewish, like Orthodox Jewish women, they actually wear niqab, which is the face covering as well. Now these are now they, Orthodox they wear, Jewish people. Keep it fair and balanced. Why don't you talk about them? They have Ask his Jewish friends to talk <laughs> about them. <laughs> absolutely. Why not? Yeah. Even if 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 your argument, well, they're a significant minority. Well, frankly, the w- women who wear uh, niqab or the face covering in the Muslim community are also a significant minority. Just the fact that you have 1.8 or whatever it is, according to Pew, billion Muslims and maybe about 30 to 50 million Jews might dis- make it disproportionate in terms of numbers, but in terms of ratio, it might be the same. So if you have a problem with those practices, I don't see you making the same argument with Jews. I don't, I've never, you've, you've had Jews on your show. Why don't you speak to, why, why don't you bring the things? They usually up? make these arguments also about, you know, Sharia is infiltrating and mm. taking over. They got no go zones. Yeah. Talk about that. Don't they have places now mm. that you actually have, you know, uh, places where it's strictly for Orthodox Jews absolutely. in in your part of the world? Absolutely. In London. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, that's now right. Y- you've witnessed this. Absolutely. I've had, I actually had a, a discussion in Speaker's Corner with one Orthodox Jew. Um, and these are peaceful discussions you're having. Yeah, yeah brilliant discussions. Uh, he wasn't offended. Um, yeah. People can, can, can watch that. It's I just want to talk to you about one issue that you, your experience, forget about religion, your experience. As Muslims, I'm always being told you need to integrate. As Muslims, we need to integrate, integration. We hear this all the time. All the time, bro. Now listen, I was quite surprised and shocked. <laughs> Wait a minute. Why? Let me tell you why. I went to Stanford Hill, driving. <laughs> And I'm sure you've done the same. My friends say the same thing. No, let me, let me, I'm not saying it's bad. Yeah, Listen to me carefully. Uh, Rovios, driving around. I saw an ambulance. Well, this ambulance is a bit different, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait a minute. Wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why is the ambulance so different? Yeah. I realize it's a Jewish ambulance. Yeah, they have their own thing. But then I go into the, I've, I'm told, go into the, uh, the hospital, and there's a Jewish section. Yes. The Royal Free. Wait, hold on. The whole top upstairs. Wait, wait, yes wait no? hold on, hold on. The Royal Free. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Royal Free. Wait, hold on. There's more to yeah, the no, Royal Free. No, it's good free. there. The whole top section is theirs. Now, I see the men in one side of the road and the woman walking on the other side of the road. Correct. Yes. Correct. Now, listen to this. The men, this is a street in London, yeah, in liberal London. The men are walking on one side of the road and the women are saying, now I'm saying, well done. Okay, you've done what you need to do. No problem, yeah? I'm not, I haven't got, I haven't got a problem with that, okay? But we're not talking about the inside the synagogue. We're talking about in the streets. Everything that Islamophobic people are angry about Islam with is found in Judaism. Done, done, done. Everything from A to Z. Wallahi, everything that Islamophobic people are angry about Islam in are in Judaism. That's something I'm making as a comment. Everything. It's, um, it's just me and... Uh, and that's a lesson we want to take. We bring up Jewish people. We bring up other people. We're, yeah. we're not of trying to offend people. We're not trying to divide people. Absolutely not. But the point is, there's, there's an area called Stoke Newington in London. Um, this area is North London. Uh, this area is, is, is a Jewish kind of... I'm not saying majority, but there's... there's What's it called? Stoke Newington. Okay. Yeah. Um, this area, North London, you have synagogues, Jewish synagogues. What I was really intrigued in finding is that there are, there are actually ambulances, which are Jewish-only ambulances. Police forces, maybe not legitimately or, let's say, legally police, but pseudo-police forces, which are Jewish police forces. Not only that, you'll find that men and women are segregated in terms of on the roads of England, in the roads of London. So this is sh- uh, Jewish Sharia police. <laughs> yeah. In fact, there's, there's actually a hospital called the Royal Free, I think it's the Royal Free Hospital in London. Uh-huh which there's a, there's a Jewish only area. Yeah. So if I go into that area and I'm not Jew, it's like a kosher area or something, right? So if I go to that area and I'm not Jewish, they'll say, uh, get out of here. You're, you're not welcome in this, in this section. Uh, for, yeah. for real, for real. It's a Jewish only area. No, now, we're come not, on. Yeah, honestly, we're not saying that, look, Jewish, Jews are not allowed their own space. Oh, my, my opinion on this, my personal opinion is they, are, they should be allowed to do whatever they want to do. If they, if they feel comfortable with that kind of things, we haven't got a problem. Mm-hmm. But be fair in your analysis, because when it comes to a liberal now trying to enforce um, what David Cameron called the muscular liberalism, Joe Rogan should be thinking, okay, well, is, it only mu- is this a Muslim specific? And this is something I, I want him to apply, criticality. I want him to ask the question, is this a Muslim specific phenomena? Or is this actually something which is cross-cultural, cross-religious? Uh, it, it applies to more than one religious or cultural group. And if you ask that question, you realize that actually... It does apply to more than one group, and Jews and Muslims, Orthodox Muslims and Orthodox Jews, are very similar in many ways. Most of his criticisms and that, uh, things, 
um, would actually apply to Orthodox Jews as well. Yeah, I think we got one more. Okay. And I think uh, for the record, I hope that this, uh, for people maybe joining us late, uh, maybe you w w tuning in, watching us on uh, one of the uh, satellite channels we're on, uh, we're trying to, uh, as you interpret, I think you did, if I'm not wrong, as a, this is a peaceful gesture. Yeah, yeah, for you know? sure, for sure. Uh, Joe Rogan, who has one of the top uh, podcasts in, in America, he's uh, kind of stepped into a lane and we're trying to help him offering our services yeah. that we can help him. We want him to grow. Yeah, yeah. You know, we want him to talk with us, yeah, right, yeah. and learn. Um, so we're making ourselves available, and hopefully he'll reach out. And how can people also help to get this maybe uh, to him, right? We, this is where, you know, many of the Muslims and other people who are truth seekers who really want uh, um, him to be fair and balanced, they can also help to— Yeah, maybe, maybe put, put it on his—I don't know if he's got Instagram— Put 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 on his Instagram messages or comments or put it in his comments in his next podcast coming up. Make it clear that they, you know, they want to see um, a discussion with a Muslim, yeah. basically a fair-minded Muslim who's engaged in in these kinds of discussions, anyways. Yeah, and if you got like you know tens of thousands of uh, Muslims stepping up and say, "Come on, Joe, let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's uh, go to the next one." That they want to go to war. Um, the wrong successor. It's a historical. That's it. Difference between. Shias and Sunnis, isn't it? So it's like Baptists going after Catholics. Yeah. Sort of. Now you uh, you've talked about this topic in particular <coughs> uh, excessively. You have some videos, and then you can also let us know where people can, if Joe himself or others, they want to see some of your work. Where they yeah, yeah. So I've got you. a channel. It's just my name, Muhammad Hijab. Yeah. Um, like the hijab, H I J A B. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. hijab. Yeah, that's right. So um, I've I've got a playlist on like my discussions with Shia. I'm a Sunni, obviously. I come from that background. What does uh, that mean when you say Sunni? So people know. What does that mean? So a Sunni is an abbreviation of Ahlus Sunnati wal Jama'a. Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'a means literally following the, the as a Sunnah of the Prophet and the Jama'a of the Sahaba of the companions of the Prophet. So, in other words, we follow the Prophet and the companions thereafter. Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the companions thereafter. That's what the name is the derivative from. Shia literally means sect, or it could mean group, or it could mean uh, it could mean faction, all right? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a sect which is an offshoot of the mainstream Sunni position. So we've had this kind of discussion with Shias. Um, I've had maybe three formal debates with, with, with Shias and many informal debates with, with, with Shias. Um, it's on my channel. But um, the point is, this is really interesting because what he's doing is he's reducing very complicated differences. And th frankly, there are complicated differences to, oh, it's the, the, the success is different. Well, actually, there's a range of different issues. Um, and what that does, it dumbs down the audience. Now, it's, it dumbs down the situation for the audience. So people don't really know things. But what that indicates about this particular, this particular person is that they're not informed in that, in that way, theologically, about differences between Shia and Sunnah. They're not informed about Islam in that, in that, in that, in that way, which, which, which is required in order to make a commentary of Islam. So... I would, and once again, this is probably a good place to say, uh, you know, for, for, for Joe himself. If he really is serious about edifying himself and educating himself on this issue of Islam, because Islam is a big thing. It keeps coming up in his conversations. People, that, That's the point now. Why is it? Okay, now you're a, a uh, martial arts commentator. You're talking about nutrition, martial arts. Yeah. Islam, just out of nowhere, Islam, a whole podcast <laughs> right. dedicated on Islam. Yeah, it's why? not like it just came up in a conversation. Why do you have to have an opinion on it? Yeah, you don't have to have an opinion on this. So now you opened up a door right. for some cr constructive, some academic yeah. criticism. What we did, we didn't yeah. insult him. We didn't go to, uh, you know, put him down or whatnot. But we're saying you're out of your lane. Come make it fair and balanced. Make it fair and balanced. I think it's, it's needed now. Yeah. In order, it's, because frankly, there, there is a reputation on the line also there, uh -huh. of his podcast. Because if he wants to have a reputable podcast, which, which features a variety of different opinions on academic topics, which is not highly biased frankly on, mm -hmm. on this issue there does require there, there does need to be there needs to be this at least this um this different kind of you need to bring different people in uh -huh. and so we we're saying bring the pro-muslims in people that are author orthodox muslims believe in islam um that can actually uh, put forward a, a case for what we believe in and why we believe in it and then you can make your decision then the you make your decision tell us uh you, because you you do the the facts are there Anyone who goes looks into it, uh, you have a lot of hate speech leading to hate crimes. That's you right. have a lot of mosques 
being van- not just vandalized, but mm-hmm. firebombed, you know, uh, people being killed. In Britain, you had something recently, a few incidents. Is this right? That's right. A man came w- and with the car and just, that's you right. know, ran over. Darren Osborne, that's right. His name yeah. is Darren Osborne. And, and it, can you correlate this directly with people who are out there in this industry of fueling hate yeah. and division? Darren Osborne himself, I mean, he was looking at a particular person called Tommy Robinson. He was he was he was a, a vehement. He was someone who's an advocate for Tommy Robinson. He used to watch his videos on his iPad. He had a history that indicated that he used to watch this person. Uh, he's a right wing uh, hate preacher, really. That's what he is, mm-hmm. Islamophobe. And so that kind of you could you could argue that through inference of the best explanation, he he must have been radicalized by this kind of right wing yeah. commentary, and then he became someone who actually killed some uh, people, Muslims. We know the value of that. We cut off the internet. I mean, right now, people, as soon as you see them connected to some of these groups and someone says something online that seems like a threat, potential threat, you got, you know, the authorities knocking on their door. Exactly. But now when these neo-Nazis, when, you know, the KKK, when these type are are, are, are spewing this this venom that's out there, that's this exactly poisonous right. venom, mm-hmm. you don't see no one knocking on the door. That's exactly. a double standard. That's a problem. That's a real problem. That's uh-huh. correct. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you what do you think now um, when people say okay well this is freedom of speech well, there's no such thing as now you know uh, this yeah. hate speech it's it's freedom of speech you're trying to limit our speech brother well what I would say to them is that it, this is actually something Joe Rogan mentions quite a lot freedom of speech there was a recent interview with uh, someone called Jordan Peterson and uh, I can't make Kathy Newman <coughs> Newman or something like this in Channel Four uh, where this topic of freedom of speech came up. The question is, what are the parameters of freedom of speech? Because freedom of speech is a, is a precept which, which is an offshoot of liberalism. Liberalism is the idea. Liberalism, there are different kinds of liberalism. There's like economic liberalism. There is um, a social or physical liberalism. Um, you can say there's, um, you know, a political liberalism of checks and balances and what John Locke was talking about, Montesquieu and all these things. The truth is, on a social level, liberalism is, as J.S. Mill said, the ability to do whatever you want so long as no one, uh, so you don't harm anyone else. This is called the harm principle. Yeah, so you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else. Um, what is harm? Because if we're talking about philosophical liberalism, then when we talk about freedom of speech, we have to kind of tether freedom of speech. We have to refine this concept of freedom of speech. We have to qualify it with this harm principle. Otherwise, you'd have what you'd call utilitarianism, which is what Jeremy Bentham believed in, which is the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people which is what J.S. Mill refined. So the point is, uh, this idea of liberalism is, t- is actually refined by J.S. Mill with this harm principle. What is harm? One could argue that, for example, using the N-word is harm. It's harmful. That's why we don't do it. Even if some comedian felt it funny to use the N-word, some white comedian felt it funny to use the N-word, most people in society would say, well, look at the historical timeline look at what, what we've done to black people and now you hum- you're trying to humiliate black people with something you know is going to av- aggra- aggravate them so they're not going to accept the n-word it's socially unacceptable really and truly the parameters of freedom of speech are defined socially or socially constructed what we're saying is that if there's a significant number of muslim people that are offended with certain things like for example he keeps mentioning the drawing of cartoons if they're offended by that if they find that harmful right if you're saying that that doesn't matter, then I would argue that you're going against the harm principle. Because you're defining harm as the only harm that matters is the harm that I define that matters. So you wouldn't say the N-word. You wouldn't say certain things about Jewish people. You wouldn't make Holocaust jokes. Would, you make, would, would Joe Rogan ever make Holocaust jokes? No. Even he's a comedian. He was a stand-up comedian. Would he ever dare make Holocaust jokes? No, because he knows it's going to offend a segment. Challenge him. Yeah. Uh, if he's really about uh, freedom yeah, of speech. If you, if you believe in absolute freedom of speech, and Reza, this other guy that he had on the show, I, he also said he believes in freedom of absolute freedom of speech. I challenge you to make a few jokes about the Holocaust, a few jokes about the N-word, a few jokes about other communities, yeah, homosexuals. Make a few jokes about homosexuals. Uh, say something about homosexuals. So you know you're not going to do that because actually society has defined for you what is appropriate freedom of speech and what is inappropriate freedom of speech. So why are you so upset with the left-wing people that are being socially consistent and philosophically consistent that don't necessarily want to harm Muslim people? And this links to another precept which is really interesting called the tyranny of the majority. Now, in democracies, um, one of the things that most democratic commentators said was a problem was what is referred to as a tyranny of the majority. When you have a majority of people that believe in one thing and a minority of people that believe in something else, 
and those a majority of people actually exploit somehow or take advantage of the minority of people and that could take different forms and in our discussion today we could say actually it does take the form of insulting or saying something which would be insulting to a segment of people which in this case would be Muslims what what media streams have to understand if they want to be democratically consistent is that actually what they should be doing is amplifying the voices of the minority in order to create an equilibrium if what they're doing is counter to that and actually amplifying the voice of some segment of the majority, which is actually um, antithetical to the minority, that does anything but exacerbate the situation and create a higher exploitation for the minority, which is anti-democratic, if you think about it philosophically. So Joe Rogan, frankly, in his, um, in, in, in his commentaries and with the people that he's brought on the, on, on the bandwagon, frankly, uh, with panelists, has been nothing but... Um, fueling a tyranny of the majority that I would claim is happening already in America and the West and being, therefore, by extension, quite anti-democratic. Mm -hmm. um, if he wants to be consistent um, and he wants to humanize human... He, he doesn't want to dehumanize be human beings. He wants to allow human beings to, to celebrate the human dignity. Then what they should do, what he should do is allow for the counterbalance, amplify the voices of the minority, even if you don't like it. Noam Chomsky says something really interesting. Noam Chomsky is a very famous liberal um, kind of thinker. I think he was one of the most quoted people in, in, in a certain time period in, in, um, in certain publications and books. He said, you don't really believe in freedom of speech until you allow the people you despise the most to say what they want to say. Bring us on, Joe. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Bring us on, Joe. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead, finish. Really. That's, what, that's what I was going to say, right? This is the longest, for the record. Now, this is the longest show that we've done. The Dean Show is going on over, almost 11 years. Alhamdulillah, almost 600, I think, episodes. That shows that I do talk uh, quite a lot. No, no, <laughs> but this shows that our, our sincere and genuine um, love that we have for the people to really connect with us. You know, we didn't go on a bashing spree with Joe. No. You know, we try to connect to him in kindness in a benign way we made a, a record now history we this is the longest show right because we covered a lot he yeah. had a lot of uh, guests a lot of different topics right too much you know to to go over um in just one day let alone just one show but i think you did a great job yeah, alhamdulillah okay. now let us spend we're almost at the two hour mark <laughs> right. let's spend a few minutes because what these people do in this industry and it's a big money industry, almost a quarter, o over a quarter of a million dollars, mm -hmm. right? People don't have jobs. They're looking to get a job. So they join the industry of bashing Islam, right? Because the, mm -hmm. the limits, the boundaries haven't been set. Like, you know, you can't go ahead and criticize or say anything about what these groups that you said. Mm -hmm. But here you can. So until that's defined, people are just having a free for all. And they're making money. Mm -hmm. Sam Harris, big money. Mm -hmm. These people, if you look to the root, they're making money, man. Mm -hmm. It's a money industry, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're hoping that Joe Rogan, right? His sincerity, right? His humanism, his the human side can come mm -hmm. out. He mm -hmm. can bring us on. He can bring on someone qualified to talk it, to keep it, to set the equilibrium, like you said. Yeah. But now what they can't attack or you don't see him attack, is the main message of Islam. Let's spend a few minutes yes. talking about the main message of Islam. Yeah, I, th I think this is really important. If Joe is watching that, you know the basics of Islam, right? Uh, the basics of Islam is that, as you've mentioned, uh, and you articulated, mashallah, very concisely, unlike me, I'm very, <laughs> I talk <laughs> for a long time. <coughs> but um, it is basically submission to Allah. It's submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe Allah is a God that we believe is the only God worthy of worship. It's not a new God or moon God or whatever. It re literally, Allah comes from the Arabic word al ilah which means the God. In other words, the only God worthy of worship. It's the same God that all of the prophets before, like Moses and Abraham and Jesus and all these prophets, came and believed uh, in that God and they preached to the people to believe in that God and worship in that God. And so all of the prophets, we believe, um, came with that. Um, in chapter 7 verse 158 of the Quran it says قُلْ يَا إِيُّهُ الَّذِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا that the Prophet is told to us to say that O oh, human beings I am your messenger for all of humanity for all of humanity so the distinction between the Prophet 
Muhammad and all of the other prophets that came before him is that he came for all of the human beings whereas all of the other prophets came for their locality as it says in the, in the book of Matthew do not go in the way of the Gentiles for I was only sent to the lost ship of Israel say that Jesus came for the lost ship of Israel Moses came for the, for the Israelites etc the prophet Muhammad came for all of the human beings in the world uh, and he came to sp spread this message of submission to the one God who created the universe who is sustaining and maintaining the universe um, and who set the test for human beings on this earth um, and, and frankly this test is to either believe in this God um, and to worship in this God wholeheartedly or to, to think somehow that you came into existence from nothing, by nothing and you're going nowhere uh, and we would say that the first uh, thing that I've mentioned here is more rationalizable uh, is more spiritually invigorating uh, it, it, is, it appeals to human beings more psychologically and rationally and therefore from our perspective it's the best thing to to follow so we are muslims speaking of that i think it was in your part of the world oxford mm -hmm. they did a study i think they had like 52 some uh, researchers uh, from anthropology yeah, that's right you know this study yes yes and they concluded that it's innate for the human being to believe that's a, a really good point that's right. So the study was done in 2011. You know about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's um, the Oxford Anthropological Society. Mm. It was a cross, um, it was a multidisciplinary study that spanned um, for many years. In fact, it, it included many different countries and it, it said, it summarized, and it's not just a study, there's many different studies which had the same result, that the belief in God is innate, is intrinsic, is psychologically predisposed human beings are predisposed to believing in God. Mm -hmm. And that's why you'll find for the majority of human civilization, human beings have believed in a God, whether it be Allah or any other God by any other name. Mm -hmm. But they, human beings are either have been historically monotheistic, or polytheistic, atheism. Yes, it has existed from, from a very long time ago, but it's only become popular recently um, within demographic terms. So really and truly, we would say that believing in God and the God that created you, the one who sustained you and, uh, and is sustaining us, is, uh, is an intrinsic, predisposed part of our psychological capacities, which we should, if we want success, refer back to. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Quran is called dhikr, by the way. It's called dhikr as a reminder. Mm -hmm. Because in chapter 7, verse 174, it says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, when he took from, with akhadna min bani asra'im min dhuhurihim dhurriyatan, that when we told, when we got from the uh, the children of Adam, their souls, because we believe in the metaphysical soul, this soul was basically, we say in a nutshell, programmed t to the submission of God. So, and this is, by the way, in philosophical works like R Rene Descartes mentions this uh, in the meditations, in the book of philosophy called Meditations. When a human being was born and the soul was put into that human being, he intrinsically is predisposed to the idea of a God. We believe that. Um, moreover, when now the Quran comes, the idea that one and, and the idea that one God Tawhid, the idea that one God exists and that He is the sustainer, maintainer, etc., and that you should follow Him, comes about, then human being recollects, he remembers, and therefore he comes back to his original fitra state, which is the idea that he is he is built literally created for the worship of Allah subhanahu yeah. wa ta'ala. We thank uh, Joe Rogan for the peaceful gesture, wearing the uh, surname, the shirt that people are seeing constantly here. Yeah. And that's why we've dedicated, we see that genuinely, I think there's some there's some good in this man. Mm. And God willing, God Almighty, Allah works in ways, you know, and I think the um, that hopefully he's got some plan for us. So maybe next time we're gonna be sitting all three of us together yeah, Allah, with great. him and what you said and we'll, we'll finish off i usually give people this homework i think it's something rational we quoted this study because he's like a man of science and these are scientists mm. and they're coming forward and saying that it's innate yeah the belief in god <coughs> so i usually tell people because what happens is man-made re religions they usually push people away from god from mm -hmm. the creator let's That's say right. the creator because mm -hmm. people see the flaws there mm -hmm. but i don't think anyone can disagree when we say look the, the reality, can we say the reality, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. that created all of this, mm -hmm. 
that Jesus didn't create this. Exactly. So we're not going to worship Jesus. That's it. Moses didn't create this. Muhammad didn't create this. But they all agreed. They were brothers in faith. And they said, worship the one who created all this. Exactly. So shouldn't we? Look, I leave for Joe and anybody mm. watching. This is your homework. Ask the reality. No middleman. No secretary put you on hold. Mm. Dial direct mm. up to the creator and say, guide me. If these brothers, if these people, if these Muslims, which Muslim is simply one who submits to the will of God, if they're onto something, the truth is there because there's something really powerful, that pure monotheism that people love. They love that about Islam, that there is nobody that you have to go through. You're not worshiping a saint, an idol. I often say a stick, a stone, a man, a woman, <laughs> you know, your ideas. But <laughs> you worship the one who gave you life and will give you death. And you call upon that creator alone, alone, simple, <laughs> guide me. Guide me to what the truth is. Why am I here? What's my purpose? Everything has a purpose, I often say. But you don't have a purpose, Joe Rogan? Mm. Right? You're just going to turn to dust, go to sleep, and that's it. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. That doesn't make it sense. Doesn't make sense. No, no, it doesn't. That doesn't make yeah, sense, hard does hard. it? No, it doesn't. So what else? Anything else you want to tell no, Joe? That's perfect, man. If we can see him now, that would yeah. be brilliant. Hopefully, uh, God Almighty Allah and uh, you know can... Uh, Get this to him and you, people, like you said, they can share this. They can go ahead and, and uh, comment on his videos, comment. on his podcast, on his Instagram. Uh, that's, a, that's a good way of he will, he will know. Mention, mention the Dean Show, mention Muhammad Hijab, mention uh, Eddie from the Dean Show. Mention those things in the comments. And if, if there's enough of those comments, he'll see them. And if he sees them, and if you even put the link of this video on, that, on, the, on the comment, that would be even, even better. Beautiful. Yeah, and he, he can look you up, Muhammad Hijab, and he that's can right. see some of your work and everything Inshallah. there. Beautiful. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> thank you, Jazakallah. And thank you guys for tuning in. Take that advice. Share it. If you care, share. And tune in here every week to the Dean Show. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum.